pounds per like gym. Yes, uh, we only have seven minutes for that, right? Yeah. All right. So uh, let's by the way, this. everything is recorded. Now it's live streaming on YouTube. Sounds great. Okay. So, Diego. Yes. Can you hear me? Let me just. Yes. And you, can you hear me? Very well. Okay. All right. So, Diego, we only have a few minutes. And. Uh, one question that uh, I would like to ask you is the following. Uh, it's uh, in general is very has been uh, very difficult uh, to see in academia, for example, people that are uh, interested in uh, experiments. Uh, sometimes uh, computer science or uh, computational mechanics or uh, uh, theory or other fields uh, uh, dominate, and uh, you are a, a very talented experimentalist. Uh, can you share with us uh, how you developed uh, your interests in uh, experiments and uh, how could you develop uh, experiments that are uh, quite amazing, like, uh, for example, experiments that led to the explanation of uh, the Ziegler paradox? How do you go from the beginning to explaining the Ziegler paradox? Well, this is a, a long story that goes back also to when I was a child, uh, because my dad was a car carpenter and uh, he used to teach me a lot uh, to use the hands, because nowadays it's not so common to use the hands to do things. And uh, when I was a kid, I started to, to play. Uh, to creating some uh, small uh, objects, like, for instance, some uh, small furniture or something like that. So I developed this, this capability to use the ends to create uh, something that is probably not common in, uh, in, uh, in other guys. And then uh, this is one side of the medal. Then uh, the other part that complete the puzzle is that I had the luck to, to, to met uh, Professor Davide Bigoni during my path. And uh, I remember in the class that I attended at the third year in, uh, in my bachelor degree, that uh, the course was solid mechanics. And uh, Professor Bigoni used to bring some teaching models to the class. And, uh, and uh, he asked us in some way to, to, if there are some guys that could uh, help in, uh, in doing that uh, uh, models. And uh, I was fascinating about that because I thought maybe with my capability to use the hands and uh, I can create something useful also for students because uh, in the end, uh, this is also important. And uh, we started collaborating on that and, uh, and uh, we did the, the bachelor together. And then from there on, I, it is started what uh, is my academic path. And uh, of course, in addition to that, one has to have also an engineering view of things because the hands on their own is they are not enough. So I think that there is a sort of combination between uh, what is the manual capability, but also the knowledge of solid and structural mechanics. And uh, this is what Professor Bigoni helped me during the path. So we put this thing together and uh, we were able to, to create, I think, very nice experiments that explained uh, and, uh, and solved also some, uh, some, uh, some problems that were open uh, uh, till the past. This is in few words what happened to me, uh, more or less. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Diego. Uh, this is quite inspirational. And uh, we only have a few minutes, and uh, I have notes that uh, instabilities, uh, they are a theme of your work and also will be a theme of your uh, seminar today. Can you uh, tell us uh, a little bit about uh, your uh, experimental work uh, to sort out uh, the Ziegler paradox? Uh, maybe uh, it's not fair to ask this question with such a short time, but uh, you can do the best uh, that you can in the few minutes that we have. So the, in that case, I have to be honest that in the past, uh, Professor Bigoni with uh, Giovanni Noselli, that is another professor that now is uh, associate professor at CISA in Trieste, start to work uh, on that uh, topic. And uh, they provided the, the first experimental uh, realization 
of the uh, Ziegler pendulum. And uh, it was a two degree of freedom system that uh, uh, is subject to fallover forces. But the problem in that case was how to realize this fallover force because uh, Coiter, for instance, proposed the elimination of this force from the literature because he was thinking that this was a pure abstraction, a mathematical abstraction. So the idea was to use a wheel mounted on the top of the, of the, of the structure and this wheel can freely rotate. So it means that it's able to, to get only the normal component of the force. And this was the first part. The part. Then I entered in the game, and uh, there were several problems with the first experimental setup, uh, because in that case, only a few seconds of experiment could be recorded, because they were performed with a plate that was lighting basically uh, against the wheel. And uh, for instance, this could uh, was a problem, because uh, if there is some delay in the, in the starting of the oscillation, you need some time. So, we, dis we decided, I, I use the plural because in the end, uh, all the research are done in a team, so I don't want to use the, the I did, but we did. We, we tried to change the setup with a conveyor belt. And in this case, we solved the problem of the finite size of the experimental setup. And then we mounted some uh, additional transducers, like for instance, road cells, accelerometers, and other things that allow us to, to solve the problem, the Ziegler paradox, that is a quite counterintuitive phenomena that happen in flutter instabilities. And uh, this was, uh, was uh, quite, uh, quite nice. And uh, that machine also can be used to, to perform other things, for instance, fatigue tests, or simulate what happened in, for instance, in the case of uh, of uh, a structure subjected to fallover forces, not just to the Ziegler pendulum of the back column or the, flu of the Fluger column, but also for other things. So yeah, and uh, we, we modify and we go ahead. Uh, we, the, the idea was not born in one shot, but as usual happened in the research, several steps uh, follow each other. And uh, in the end, we, we realized that uh, beautiful machine that allow us to solve this problem. Uh, that's great. Uh, thank you, Diego. And uh, for the audience uh, that is attending, uh, if you are interested to know more about the Ziegler paradox and uh, the experiments and theory to address the problem, you can uh, look for uh, the paper in uh, JMPS, uh, Journal of the Mechanics and Physics of Solids, uh, 2018, that is titled F Flutter and uh, Divergence Instability in the Flieger Column. Experimental Evidence of the Ziegler's Destabilization Paradox, JMPS 2018, uh, Volume 116, pages uh, 99 to 116. So JMPS 2018, you can uh, find the paper. All right, uh, Jimmy, I think uh, it's about time for us to get uh, yes. started with the seminar, yes. correct? Please start, please start, close it. Oh, there right. is a, a, a raised hand that is Zeb that is asking something. Ah, okay. Uh, Zeb, you have a question? Oh, 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 no, sorry. I, I was responding to the comments of those who are interested to be panelists. Please raise your hands. Sorry. <laughs> okay. okay. You are already a panelist. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. I am uh, Glaucio Paulino from uh, Princeton University, and I am uh, going to moderate uh, the EML webinar today that uh, will be given by uh, Professor uh, Diego Miceroni from uh, University of Trento. He will talk to us about uh, reprogrammable frustration, multi-stability, and uh, tunable auxeticity in uh, origami metamaterials. Uh, Diego is presently an uh, associate professor of uh, solid and structural mechanics at uh, the University of Trento in Italy. He obtained his PhD in uh, structural and solid mechanics from uh, University of Trento in uh, 2013. Afterwards, uh, he went uh, to UK, University of Liverpool, as the Mary Curie uh, experienced uh, uh, research uh, position. He was a, uh, and recently he was also a Fulbright uh, scientist at uh, Princeton University, 
uh, Dr. Miseroni has been recognized by several awards, including the current uh, 2024 Thomas Hills ASME Young Investigator Award and uh, ERC Consolidator Grant, the 2022 Extreme uh, Mechanics Letters Young Investigator Award, uh, Fulbright Fellowship, the 2022 Zwick Howell Science Award, uh, the Paul Royal Medal, and uh, the 2017 uh, AIMETA uh, Junior Prize. It is uh, my great pleasure to introduce him. Uh, Diego, the floor is yours. Okay. So maybe I can start to share my, my presentation. And uh, let me see if you can see the the screen. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yes. OK. And can you hear well? Yes. OK. So thank you very much, Professor Paulino, for the very nice introduction. For me, it's a great honor being here and have been invited to give this seminar related to some of our recent results that we have obtained in the field of origami-based metamaterials. Origami is an ancient art and is essentially the art of folding an object out of a piece of paper to create very complicated 2D and 3D subjects. For instance, the highlighted lines that you can find here uh, represent the contour map to, to, to fold a scorpion, such as the one reported here. So, but why this art can be useful for origami engineering applications? And the idea is basic, is reported here in this movie. So standard metamaterials are obtained via tessellation of a unit cell. And usually this unit cell has a geometry that cannot vary over the time. By contrast, as you can see in this movie, origami-based metamaterials are composed of cells that can morph their shape from a folded to unfolded state. And this allows to achieve highly tunable mechanical properties. With this slide, I would like just to provide a very quick glimpse of what can be achieved using origami design principle, especially for the ones in the audience that maybe may not be familiar with the topic. And as you can see here, for instance, origami method can be exploited to create innovative and sophisticated structure for space application or deployable system for civil engineering application. But moreover, origami design principle can be used also to enhance the daylight uniformity and the reduction of the energy consumption for heating and cooling in buildings, as you can see here, or can be used to create multi-directional and um, uh, muscles or, for instance, medical devices, or can be used to create high performance soft robotic arms and metamaterials. After this very short introduction, I move on to speak about our research related to the triamorph origami pattern. That this pattern we'll see later will own several unique properties such as tunable auxeticity, reprogrammable frustration, and multistability behavior. And I would like to remark that this work has been developed together with these four people reported here, Professor Kiliu, Peking University, Professor Pratapa, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, Professor Tachi, that is a professor at the University of Tokyo, and Professor Paulino, Princeton University. This is a brief outline of what I'm going to present later on. So I will start introducing the theory behind the triamorph pattern. Then I will show something related to the manufacturing method that we developed to create the tessellation, then the experimental setup that we conceived to test this highly deployable system. Then I will show some experimental results. And in the end, I will show that due to the intrinsic geometry of the triamorph cell, we can obtain reprogrammable frustrated states and multistability. To better understand what I'm going to present today, it is essential to begin by revisiting the main features of the egg box pattern and the Muraori pattern. Both patterns are obtained by the repetition of a degree four cell, but they differ in the crease assignment. In the case of the egg box pattern, as you can see here, all the creasing converging in the vertex 
has have a mountain assignment. While in the case of the Murauri pattern, one of the crease of the creases has a valley assignment. And this difference leads to a uh, different kinematical behavior of the two tessellation. And in the case of the egg of patterns, as you can see here, we have a Poisson ratio that is included in this interval between zero and plus infinity. And in the case of the mu Auri pattern, we have a Poisson ratio that is included between minus infinity and zero. To augment the design uh, space, Professor Paulino and Covortos presented a novel origami pattern that they named Mort. And this pattern combines the features of the two previously patterns that I showed before. So the new Raori and the egg box. And what is interesting is that in this case, one of the trees can switch continuously between a mountain assignment and a valley assignment. And this allows to achieve a Poisson ratio that uh, is included in this interval. So uh, from minus infinity to plus, to plus infinity. And by changing, you can see here the number of the cells in one line that are in the Mura mode or in the Xbox mode, we can change also the in-plane uh, behavior of the tessellation. To, with that said, we can now go deeper in my presentation, focusing on the triamorph pattern. And to set the stage, I will begin by showing this brief trailer of what we explore in detail later. So the system is composed of a degree four cell, as you can see here, and the cell can have three different stable states. Assembling the cell in one dimension and in the other direction, we can create a tessellation. And due to the fact that this cell can switch continuously between a Mura mode in one direction, a Mura mode in the other direction, and the neckbox mode, we can change locally the mechanical property of the material, for instance, here, and uh, exploiting the concept of the geometrical frustration. Of course, by stacking different layers of tessellation, we can obtain a 3D metamaterial. To understand the mechanical behavior of this triclinic metamaterial, we start examining the unit cell that composes the tessellation. And the cell is a degree four unit cell that consists of four tilted panels, as you can see here, joined together by four creases. And the diagonal angle here are gamma one, gamma two, and gamma three. And the folding angles are pi and, and, and psi, as you can see here. And the geometrical parameter, the design parameter of the tessellation are the angles of the panels that are represented here with the angle alpha and the angle delta. Compared to the well-known Miura, Ori, and the Echos pattern that I showed before, the triamorph pattern distinguishes itself by having a triclinic symmetry. So this means that the bounding box of the cell is composed of non-orthogonal faces. And this can be seen also here in the Cartesian frame, where if you look to the parallelogram, that is the projection of the cell on the X, Y plane, you see that if you take a side that is parallel to the to the uh, y direction. The other one is not parallel, but is inclined with this angle, eta one, that is different of 90 degrees. And you will see later that this will lead to the concept of the shear normal coupling behavior of this tessellation because of this particular symmetry. As I said before, this uh, triamorph has the unique capability to be continuously folded into three distinct modes along the kinematic path. Two of those being flat foldable and one uh, being a uh, uh, eggbox mode. And as you can see here on, on, the, on the right, we have the spherical polygon and the Gauss-Marx representation of this unit cell. And I would like to remark that spherical polygons and Gauss-Marx representation are a powerful tool to analyze the transformations of origami metamaterials. And as you can see that while the egg box mode projects a convex quadrilateral here in the Gauss map, the two Miura mode projects a tight bose uh, shape, as you can see here, but in two different directions. The kinematic path of this uh, triamorph unit cell is described by, by this implicit function that is reported here. And this implicit function is a function of the two folding angles phi and psi, but these folding angles can be related to each other. So it means that in the end, we have that this, the kinematic of the system can be governed by just one parameter, since it's a single degree of freedom 
system. And var varying the uh, design variable, for instance, alpha and delta, we can change the kinematic path. But by taking as an example, the case of an alpha of an angle alpha of 60 degrees and an angle delta of 10 degrees, we obtain this kinematic path where we can see that the system can move between a Miura mode type one, for instance, from the configuration one, two, and three. Then when this point is reached, we can enter in the Xbox mode, configuration four and five, and then the system can move again to another Miura mode type two uh, configuration that is reported here by this number six and seven. But I would like to remark and draw your attention that these two points reported here, although they can seem very pretty close to each other, they represent two very distinct modes. And in particular, there are two Miura modes in two orthogonal directions. As you can see, this mode here is quite different from, from this one here. To characterize the implant deformation of the triclinic trimorphic metamaterial, we define the, uh, the um, in-plane Poisson ratio as the negative ratio between the transversal strain and the longitudinal strain me measured along this direction, L, as you can see here, and the W direction. And in this formula, we have this derivative that can be uh, expressed in a closed form, form expression by uh, taking the total derivative of the kinematic path that I showed before. And in the end, we can uh, write down this expression that I, is a purely geometrical quantity. So as you can see here, we have just the geometrical parameters alpha, delta, and the folding angles phi and psi. Moreover, as I mentioned before, by analyzing the, uh, the, the shape of the unit cell before and after uh, the formation step for, or a folding process, we can see that the angle between the two lattice vectors, L and W, is changing during the folder process. And this leads to the uh, appearance of a, a shear normal coupling coefficient or shear normal coupling effect that is nothing else than the negative ratio between the shear strain and the longitudinal strain. And we can see later that we also uh, validate this expression to experiments. Moreover, we were also interested in the out of plane bending of this tessellation. And to do that, we introduced additional four degree of freedoms that represent the angles, the folding angles of the panels along the shorter diagonals as reported here. So we assume these four angles. And the idea to get the out of plane Poisson ratio is to track the position of the vertices of the tessellation by using some uh, geometrical relation. And the expression is very similar as idea of the one of the in-plane Poisson ratio. In this case, the the longitudinal and the transversal strain are replaced with the two curvature along the two lattice directions. Of course, this formula is very complicated, but for the shape of the space, I just decided to, to write one part and then I left the other with dots. But if you are interested, you can have a look to the supplementary material of the paper, or then we can discuss later. And I would like to remark that by comparing the in-plane Poisson ratio and the out-of-plane Poisson ratio of this, of this tessellation, we observe the property that the bending and the stretching Poisson ratio are equal but opposite in sign. And uh, this is uh, what uh, is related to the out-of-plane bending. Then, we, since in the experiments, we see later the, the experimental setup that we developed, we also monitor and measure the load applied to the tessellation during the folding and the unfolding process, we wanted also to try to derive a, an approximate formula for the load. And to do that, we write down the uh, elastic energy stored in the tessellation. And as you can see here, we imagine that all the stored energy is in the crisis. As you can see here, this UYI represents the, the stored energy in each of the crises. And this Stored energy is function of the folding angles of the diadral angles, gamma i, and then the rest angle of the tessellation and the, bend the stiffness of the crease. That is nothing else than a sort of torsional spring. This is the constitutive relation that we assume for the bending moment. And taking the derivative of the elastic energy with respect to the direction where we are applying the load, we end up with this expression for, for the load. 
And these represent the load that we need to apply to the tessellation to deform, to, to, to fold the, the, the system from one state to another. And of course, you can see here that the numbers of the cell in one direction and the other direction are appearing, of course, in this, in this formulation. Now it is the time to start to speak about experiments. I'm an experimentalist, and I like so much speaking about these experiments that we perform on origami-based metamaterials. But before to explain into detail what we did, I would like to remark that perform reliable experiments on origami materials required a deep understanding of the factor that can induce discrepancies between the mechanical properties predicted from the theory and those found experimentally, such as, for instance, the effect of boundary conditions imposed during the testing, the manufacturing method that we, we chose to, to create the tessellation, or the thickness of the panels that we use in the tessellation, the thickness accommodation problems, and so on and so forth. So now I will concentrate it on the boundary condition uh, that are, have to be imposed during the test and on the manufacturing method that we used to create the tessellation. So let's start with the manufacturing method. And usually the theoretical formula describing the mechanics of origami structure are derived under the assumption of two opposite requirements that are very difficult to reconcile in an actual experiment. And these hypotheses are rigid panel, but with zero thickness. And as you can see that these requirements are quite strong. Imagine to a, a, a panel with zero thickness that has to be very stiff. So it's very complicated. So this was the first problem that we faced once we decided to do the experiments. And we had several options, as you can see here. For instance, we could have used the laser cutter, the 3D printing, or a CNC milling machine. But for this particular case, and especially for, uh, for give the uh, evidence of the most stable behavior of this tessellation, the best option is to use the milling machine because it allows us a high degree of freedom in creating this tessellation. So what we did was a parametric design of the tessellation, as you can see here, and the milling machine is removing some material. So it's the opposite of the, what is going on with the 3D printing. With the 3D printing, you are adding material. With the CNC, you are removing material. You are subtracting something from the tessellation. And the key idea is the realization of the crease. And as you can see, in this case, we can finally tune the elastic stiffness of the creases by changing the, 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 the thickness of the cinch in other words, the, the depth of the, of the tool inserted into the panels. And this is the idea, but now I would like to, to say you something more. So to create this tessellation, in addition to the theoretical parameters that are entering in the theoretical formula, has the one reported here, for instance, the dimension of the panels A, the angle alpha. This is the case of the egg box, but uh, I will show some experiments also on this. Additional parameters have to be taken into account. And these parameters are essential to perform a good experiment. And the, the main parameters that, end, that play a role in, in, the, in the realization are the thickness T of the panel, as you can see here, represented by this T, the thickness of the hinge that represents, in other words, the torsional stiffness of the crease, and of course, the dimension of the tool that we want to use to create this crease. This is an example of realization. This is the egg box pattern. And this is the detail of a, of a cell. And as you can see here that we have four creases that are mountain assignment. And I would like to remark that you can see here in the vertices, we removed some material because this is a a problem is this is a problematic part, it's a problematic zone of the tessellation because we have a sort of stress concentration of the formation concentration that can prevent the sample to, to be completely folded. This is uh, the, uh, the tessellation that we created for the triamorph pattern. And this is a short movie that I created to show how the tessellation is created. As you can see here, we have the milling machine that is removing some material, and several seats and extension are created. And these seats and the extension 
can match each other to create a perfect glue and to create a perfect tessellation. As you can see here, this is a different pattern, but the idea behind the concept, the concept behind the method is exactly the same. As you can see here, I can show it again. As you can see, now are, we are creating the creases. These are the seats. And these are the strips that are glued together to create the tessellation. So standard uniaxial testing on metamaterials are conducted by clamping the two ends of the sample to the testing machine. However, this method results in a non-uniform transversal deformation, as you can see here. And this uh, deformation causes a dog bone shape in the sample if we are performing, for instance, a tensile experiment. And this problem is even more problematic for highly deployable systems like origami tessellations, as it leads to high experimental inaccuracy. Because the, the question is, where we have to measure the transversal deformation, for instance, to, uh, to measure the Poisson ratio of the tessellation, because each point is different, right? So it means that we can choose randomly a position and we can get different responses depending on what we want to see, but we don't want to act in this way. So we want something reliable. So when we started to analyze this problem, we asked ourselves, can we invent a new novel gripping system that prevent uh, the, sample, the sample to exhibit a dog bone shapes. So in other words, that allow the sample to freely deploy in the transversal direction. And the answer is yes. And this is the work that has been published in Extreme Mechanics Letter last year. And this is the work that got the cover and also that allowed me to uh, achieve, to get the high prestigious ex uh, Extreme Mechanics Letter Young Investigator Award. And now I will explain the idea behind this, this setup. So the idea uh, is this one. Compared to the traditional setup, where the sample is clamped by two smooth plates, in this setup, the sample is constrained by a linear system. And this linear system that is reported here is composed of several sliders that can freely slide without friction against a perfectly fitting uh, rail as reported here. So here is the, the detail. And this system allow the, the tessellation itself to drive the position of the slider between the rail. And, and the, the whole apparatus, as you can see here, has been arranged horizontally to prevent uh, a spurious or problematic effect of gravity, for instance, and also to prevent out of plane buckling of the tessellation. And below, beneath the tessellation, we decided to use also a Teflon plate to reduce as much as possible the friction between the tessellation and the testing platform during the experiments. And we, you can see here that there is another detail, other two details, by the way. The first detail that I would like to remark is that the slider in the middle is equipped, uh, the one here and the one here, is equipped with a locking system. And this is essential to avoid the tessellation to suffer of rigid motion to, during the, the, the testing. And the other key point of the setup is that each slider is equipped with this two-piece uh, PMMA uh, system here. And this is instrumental if we want to change the tessellation to be tested. Because for instance, different tessellation can have different heights. Also, and also if we want to test, for instance, diff, uh, uh, 3D meta, uh, metamaterials with different layers. So by using this uh, escamotage here, this trick here, we can add a huge versatility to, to our equipment. And I will show later because uh, we modified a bit this setup to perform the experiments on the triamorph pattern, because you, as you can see here, I forgot to say, but this is the morph pattern uh, that I mentioned before, the one proposed by Paulino and co-authors. And we can change the numbers of these sliders. So it means that if we have a tessellation that instead of having three cells in this direction have 10 or six or seven, we can change these sliders and we can test tessellation with different, with different uh, numbers of cells. 
And we will see in a couple of slides that the, by eliminating the, deep, the, the, the negative impact of the dog bone shape on the measurements of the Poisson ratios, we, with this novel fixture, we improved a lot the agreement between experiments and theory. In other words, the, the, these setups allowed to test a relatively small samples that are reliable in the sense of representing a true periodic system without violating, for instance, the underlying theoretical hypothesis. Moreover, we also located a camera orthogonal to the testing platform because during the test, we wanted to monitor the movement of the vertices of the tessellation because we were interested in capture the evolution of the Poisson ratio of different tessellation during the folding and the unfolding process. And uh, that's, uh, that's it. This is the detail. As you can see, the detail that I mentioned before, this is the locking system, this is the slider, and this is the fishing wiring that, wire that we used to connect the tessellation to the slider system. And this is a picture that provides a clear message of what is going on. As you can see, this is the clump, and this is the morph pattern. And as you can see, that the pattern uh, exhibit this dog bone shape. On the other side, we have the same pattern, but constrained with this slide, linear uh, slide system. As you can see, that now the lines are more or less parallel to each other. So it means that these cells here, they form transversally the same as these three and the same as this here three. So this tessellation is, is not suffering anymore of the problem of the dog bone shape. We wanted to validate this setup on well-known patterns. And first of all, we tested the standard egg box and the standard neura ore. The highlighted region here in the middle represent the, the, the part of the tessellation where we monitor the Poisson ratio. And these are some results. As, as you can see that the theory and the experiments are quite superimposed each other. And also the simulation that we perform in a specific software uh, developed by Professor Paulino and his co-authors that allow to, to simulate origami materials uh, are confirming the, the theory, as you can see here. And the egg box, as I mentioned before, has a positive Poisson ratio. The standard Miura Ori has a negative Poisson ratio. And what is surprising is that the experiments are too much superimposed to the theory. And this is a record of the experiments, as you can see here. We have the tessellation, and here we have the, the load cell, because during the test, we are also measuring the load. As you can see, look, look, I would like to draw your attention on this. You see the tessellation is expanding in a transversal di the direction, and the sliders are moving in the transversal direction. So it means that it's the tessellation itself that drives the motion of the slider during the test. Now is the, is the, is the round of the standard egg box. This is the schematic of the experiment. And you can see here that during the test, now the Poisson ratio is positive, but please have a look to what is happening to this slider here, to this slider here, and to the tessellation on this line. You see that now this distance is getting uh, smaller and smaller because the tessellation tends to contract in the transversal direction. Then we wanted to uh, validate this setup also on the morph pattern. And as you can see here, we have the unique property of this pattern is that can present different in plane behavior, mechanical behavior, by changing the assignment of one cell into the line. For instance, here we have the case where all the uh, cells are in the egg box mode. So it means that the, we have zero Mura mode type uh, cell here. Here we have two egg box mode, egg box cell, and one Mura mode. This is the one reported here. Here we have two Miura modes and one egg box, and here we have three Miura modes. And what is happening is this. So by moving from Nm equal to zero, that is the case of the egg box where the Poisson ratio is positive, by introducing some Miura mode type cell into the tessellation, we have the Poisson ratio is reducing. As you can see here with a cell that is in the Miura mode, we have a Poisson ratio that is below. Then with two Miura mode cells and one egg box, we have this very interesting behavior that we have a constant Poisson ratio 
over a large strain. As you can see here, we have almost constant Poisson ratio. And then we have a switch from positive to negative. And of course, when the tessellation is uh, in the neural mode type uh, uh, configuration, we have that the Poisson ratio is included between zero and minus infinity. So let's now show the experiments that we perform on this tessellation. This is the case of the where all the cells are in the Mura, in the egg box mode, sorry. And as you can see here on the right, we have the Merlin simulation, the theory and the experiments that are quite superimposed each other. But please, also in this case, have a look to what is happening to the tessellation. You see, the sliders tend to move depending on the deformed state of the sample. This is the case where we have one cell in the Miura mode and two, cell in, two cells in the Xbox mode. And as you can see that also in this case, we have a slightly lower Poisson ratio, but it's well captured in the experiments. As you can see, please have a look here, what is happening, have a look. You see this slider is getting closer and closer to this one. Now let's see what is going to happen with the hybrid state and M equal two. And here we have two Miura modes, you see here, and one Xbox mode. And the experiments are these. So you see, we have that the Poisson ratio is close to zero over a wide deformation. But then once this point is reached, this point here, we have a switch from small positive to negative. And please have a look to the sliders now. You see, the sliders tend to open to capture this behavior. Now, the last one that I will show is this one that is related to the tessellation where all the cells are in the neural modes. And in this case, also, of course, the Poisson ratio is negative. So it means that the tessellation tend to expand in the transverse adulation while we are applying a folding an unfolding process. Now I can go back again to show some experiments on the triamorph pattern, because we want to first validate the setup and then perform the experiments on the triamorph pattern, because these experiments are a bit more complicated than the one that I showed before. So we modified slightly the, the setup. And as you can see here, you can see the versatility of this setup because now you see the numbers of the sliders are not anymore three and three, but as you can see here, we have four and here we have five. So we can change this number to better connect the tessellation to the, sli to li the linear sliding system. And also in this case, we have the locking mechanism to prevent the rigid motion. But an additional thing that we had to impose, because this system has a triclinic symmetry, so it tends to be very complicated to be fixed and to be kept horizontal during the test, we need to add these wedges here. You see these wedges? And these wedges help the experiments, they help the tessellation to don't suffer of out of plane buckling. These are some experiments and on the triamorph pattern, on the trimorph pattern. Uh, as you can see here, we have the theory in black. And here we have three different experiments that we perform on the tessellation. And you can see here, and here we are performing tensile experiments. So it means that we are starting from a folded configuration and we unfold the system. And here we are starting from an unfolded configuration and we are folding the system. But as you can see that, the, both the experiments are confirming the, experi the theoretical prediction. And in addition to this qualitative uh, assessment, we also provide a quantitative assessment by evaluating the R square coefficient and its standard deviation. And as you can see that this number is close to one. So it means that we have a good agreement between what is the theory and what is the experiment. Moreover, as I mentioned before, this uh, triamorph cell, trimorph cell has a triclinic symmetry. So it means that we have the emergence of a shear normal, normal effect that is quantified through this shear normal coupling coefficient reported here. And the one in black is the theory and the colored uh, markers represent the experience. And as you can see that also in this case, except to, for this part here, because in this part of the tessellation, there is a sort of thickness accommodation problem. So you have some discrepancies here from the experiments and the theory. But globally, the experiments are confirming the theory. And I would like to, to remark that you see here, this coefficient is close to 0 because in the Xbox mode, the trimorph pattern 
it's more or less in an orthotropic uh, uh, symmetry state. Then we also uh, try to validate the, the formula that we, we have developed for, for the load uh, applied to the tessellation during the folding and unfolding process. And here you can see the experiments that are, again, the color of the lines and the theory that are the black lines reported here. And as you can see that more or less the, uh, the theoretical formula is able to predict to predict quite well the experiments. And this is also evident by the R square coefficient reported here that is not one, but is close to one. So it means that the, the, the theory is quite good. Now let's see some uh, record of the experiments. And as you can see now, this is a record of the experiment. Look at the slider. So in this case, I would like to remark this. The system starts from an unfolded state that is an eggbox mode. But look, when the system can switch continuously to a neural mode type, uh, type 2 mode, the Poisson ratio also switches from positive to negative, as you can see here. We have the transition from positive Poisson ratio to negative Poisson ratio. And also the sliders, you can see, can uh, uh, allow this freely deployment of the tessellation. Then, of course, we have a reversible oxidicity. So it means that we can start from a folded state and we can unfold the system. So the Poisson ratio, as you can see here, is, is negative. Then when the, the tessellation switch between a Mura mode type 2 to the Eggbox mode, we have a, also a Poisson ratio switch from negative to negative to, to positive, as reported here. And please have a look also in this case to what is going on in the slider. I will show you once more this movie because it's quite, uh, it's quite impressive in, in my opinion. As you can see here, we have the compression experiments, as you can see here. So look, look at the slider, how it tends to expand in this direction during the test. Then we have, look at here, we have the Poisson ratio switch from positive to negative. As you can see here, this is the point, you see? Now we have the transition between the two uh, folding states, and then the Poisson ratio is negative. And this is the shear normal coupling coefficient, as you can see here, uh, in real time, live. This uh, is the tensile experiment. So we have that the Poisson ratio switches from negative to positive, as you can see here. And you see, the sliders tend to expand first and then will will contract later because we have the transition, you see, Poisson ratio switch from negative to positive. Okay. With this said, we can uh, show another peculiar characteristics of this trimorph pattern, trimorph tessellation, and is the emergence of a line and a point or, or point defects into the tessellation. But to understand the formation of the point defects, we, we perform nonlinear structural analysis. And to do that, we, we perform some simulation and we use Merlin software that implements, I, I didn't mention before, but this software is quite uh, nice and is quite, uh, Performing, perform, uh, it's a high performance software to, to perform this kind of experiments. And this software implement a barren hinge model. And each panel during this uh, simulation are being, uh, being discretized with four triangles. And uh, during the, the simulation, we first uh, simulate the formation of a line defect, the one uh, reported here, that is the transition between the state one to the state two. As you can see here, we are applying this y-x displacement. Then once this, this line this defect is formed, we can apply another uh, displacement to this line, for instance, in the y direction. And we have the transition from two to three. And the intersection between these two lines reported here represent the point effect. 
This graph here represents the variation of the elastic energy storing, stored in the, in the assemblage during the transition process. And these terms here represent the folding energy in the, in the crisis, the bending energy in the panels, and the stretching energy uh, in the panels uh, again. But uh, what I want to say is that examining the, the stored energy in the system during the entire process, we, from one to two to three, we observe that the configuration tree, the configuration tree stores significantly more energy than one and two. And this is mainly caused because of the non-rigid origami deformation that is required to create the point effect. And I would like to also mention that if we want to uh, unfold uh, uh, or the, the, the point effect, we need to reverse exactly the folding order. In other words, the point effect can lock the pattern if one tries to uh, resolve them in the wrong order. And this may become very useful, for instance, for encoding hysteresis information into the material or mechanical memory, or to be used, for instance, in mechanical logical computing system, or to change locally the mechanical properties of the tessellation. Because, for instance, here we can change the density of the tessellation, we can change the rigidity, and so on and so forth. Now I will show a movie of the simulations and uh, that will show the emergence of, of the first the line defect and then the point defect into the tessellation. You can see here we are performing the simulation on the, on the 2D assemblage. First, we have the formation of the line defect in this direction. You see, this is the line defect. This is the line defect. Now, if we create another line defect in the other direction, we can create a point defect, as you can see here. So the intersection between these two lines represents the, po the point defect, as you can see here. Now let's let move on to speak to another property of this trimorph, trimorph pattern. But I would like to say this. Usually, in the literature, the term multistability is used as a synonym of bistability. But in this case, the intrinsic geometry of the trimorph origami allows for the first example of tristable origami. And this is evident by analyzing the, the stored energy into the system. And to do this calculation, we assume the hypothesis of rigid origami. So it means that all the stored energy is inside the creases. And in this formula, we have that Kf is the rotational stiffness of, of the crease. And gamma one, sorry, gamma high bar is the rest angle of, of the configuration. And by tuning this folding, this, uh, the, the fold energy parameters, we can program the energy landscape of this tessellation. But for the shake of simplicity, we decided to, uh, to, to assume this hypothesis. So we assume that these two hinges here, these two creases here, are free of rotation. So it means that these creases are hypothesized li like having zero rotational stiffness while these other two creases here have the same rotational stiffness. And this is a simplification that was quite instrumental to, 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 to simplify the manufacturing of these, of these models. But in principle, you could change these, these, uh, these uh, values. You can do it that different. And what is changing is basically what is represented here, that is the energy contour that under this hypothesis, I mean, two equal uh, creases with the same stiffness and two equal creases with zero uh, rotational stiffness, we have that the energy contour is a circle. And where the energy contour touches the kinematic path represents the three stable configuration of the system that are evident if you observe this graph reported here on the right. So all the stable states, as you can see here, rest 
in a non-zero energy base. So it means that in all the stable state, there are some elastic energy stored into, into the system. And as you can see here that we have the black line that is the theory under the hypothesis of uh, rigid origami, while the numerical simulation here are performed assuming also the, the, the bending of the panels. Now, before to show the final movie of the, uh, of the emergence of the multistability in this tessellation, I would like to show this one. So to create this tessellation, we need to modify a bit the manufacturing process. And in this case, the one millimeter thick polypropylene sheets that we use to create the trimorph or the egg box or the morph uh, tessellation that I showed before is replaced with a two millimeter thick polycarbonate uh, sheet. And as you can see here, there are some seats uh, in, the, in the panels that duly houses the hinges reported here. And the two hinges that have the uh, wanted elastic uh, stiffness are created by cutting with a milling machine, a solid, uh, 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 a solid silicone rubber uh, piece. And these two uh, hinges here represent the polypropylene hinges that we use to connect the other two panels. And in other words, these hinges here approximate the free of rotation as, uh, hinges that is required by the uh, theoretical hypothesis. This is the assemblage of these pieces reported here in the top row. And of course, by assembling several cells in one direction, we can have a 1D uh, system and assembling this into direction, we have a 2D tessellation. Now I can show the movie, but let me just stop sharing and then I will share again because I don't know when I shared the screen if I I I, I said to the to the Zoom to to share also the audio because here the key point is to to listen also to the audio. Uh, you see, I didn't that, so I can do it now. This is quite important. As you can see, now please have increase the volume of, of your computer because it's quite important. And we can go ahead. And this is the movie. You see, this is the unit cell. These are the four panels with different angles, 50, 60, 70, and 60. These are the rigid panels. These are the three hinges, and these are the elastic hinges. Now, please. You, you, you should hear the, the click sound because this is quite important. It means that we have a strong multistability in the system. You see? And we have these three different states, one in one direction, one in the other, and one that is in the egg box configuration. Then we create the 1D, the 1D uh, system, as you can see here. And uh, in the end, we created also the to the tessellations. The to the tessellation is this. You can see the system can snap between different states because some energy is stored into the into the system. I will show it again because this is quite uh, nice. So this is the unit cell. These are the three hinges. These are the elastic hinges. And uh, you see, now there is the first snap, Miura mode one, egg box mode, and Miura mode in the other direction. You see here, it is written here, Miura mode two. Now, by assembling this cell in 1D, we can obtain the 1D assemblage. You can see we have this snap, snap, and snap. And then we can have also the snap in the other direction. Here we have the 2D assemblage. As you can see, we have the snapping in this direction, in this direction. And then we can have the snap in the other direction. Okay, 
With that said, I can say that by stacking different layers of this tessellation in the Z direction, we can obtain a 3D metamaterial as the one reported here. As you can see here, we have two levels and the trick is to create this, very, uh, this thin extension to connect the one, one level to the other level. And then I would like to conclude saying uh, 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 a huge thank you to the collaborators that allowed me to, 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 to achieve these this amazing results on origami uh, metamaterials that are Professor Liu, Professor Patap, I already mentioned, Professor Tassi and Professor Paulino. Then I would like to, to thank you a lot, the uh, EML webinar organizer for providing the opportunity to present my work in this uh, prestigious event. And then of course, I want to acknowledge also my grant that I obtained, an ERC consolidator grant that is supporting my research. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you have any question, I can try to, to answer if I'm able to. Thank you very much, Diego, for the very informative uh, presentation, uh, very, very nice presentation and uh, very clear, very detailed. And uh, we open the floor now for questions. Uh, if uh, anyone has questions, uh, please uh, go ahead and uh, raise your hand or manifest yourself and the floor is open. All right, uh, Suleen, you are the first one. Hey, Diego, um, very nice talk. Very clear. I like your pictures and movies. <laughs> so beautiful, funny. Um, I have one question. Uh, I found that that when you engineer this uh, origami, um, you, theoretically you claim that the Poisson's ratio can go from negative infinity to positive inf infinite, right, infinity. Uh, but in reality, in practically, uh, the Poisson ratio in your experiment, which you showed us, uh, can find it in the range of like a positive negative two, something like that. So, what? How would you? How would you increase the Poisson ratio range in your engineering of the origami? Is there any limit? Do you really can achieve like an infinite Poisson ratio? Uh, this is a very nice question, and. Uh... Yeah, the problem uh, that is very difficult to achieve uh, such a high Poisson ratio in the two direction, I mean, to, towards the positive values and towards the negative values, is because if maybe I can, I can show again, but uh, I can, uh, well, maybe I can use the blackboard, but the, the thing is that in the, in the region where the Poisson ratio tends to infinity, you have a deep slope. And this slope being so, so steep, so steep prevents in the experiment to achieve high values because we, you, you have the problem of the thickness accommodation. Although this, uh, this, uh, this setup and this uh, tessellation has been uh, done with one millimeter thick polypropylene, there are some thickness. So this thickness accommodation problem prevents to, to achieve this uh, such high value of the Poisson ratio. Uh, I don't know exactly how can be uh, done uh, to, to, to increase up to 20 or 30, because this is quite complicated, but for increase a bit uh, the value, maybe playing with the, the, the width of the part where the creases are created. So maybe I can use this one. So if you see here, we have this tessellation and uh, Maybe I can, maybe if I can, I can pin myself in some way. So I can, I don't know. I, can you, can you see myself now? Can you see well the tessellation? Yeah. So what happened is that when you fold this, you see, and you want to increase the Poisson ratio, for instance, in the, in the negative value, because here we are in the neural mode. What happened is that you cannot squeeze more than this, the tessellation, because you have the problem of the thickness. So probably by playing with this, uh, I mean, this part here, you see here, this part, maybe widening a bit the part where the crisis is created or by removing some materials in specific zone where the panels are touching each other, maybe you can increase a bit this range. But 
I don't expect that you can go uh, quite far because now I can I can share again one second and you can see here you have that this slope is quite steep so it means that if you want to get uh, some values here a small variation produces a high values I have some points here for instance of the Poisson ratio and if you want I can provide the raw data because I I think that in the research the data should provide it because uh, so other researchers can do the experiments. But I, some data here, because of this problem, uh, start to, 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 to jump uh, out of the, of the plot because of this thickness problem. And uh, yeah, probably playing with uh, some strategies, removing some material here and there, preventing the touching of the panels to each other. You can improve a bit, but I don't expect that you can reach 50 or 60. I don't expect that. Do you think that theory and has of a course, do you think that hysteria has an issue? Because you claim that at the beginning, theoretically, you can achieve positive, negative infinity to positive infinity. How about yes. what, what, what yes, other because... condition, theoretical condition that you can achieve that? Well, uh, if you assume that the panels have zero thickness, in that case, uh, you don't have the problem of the thickness accommodation. So. And this is the point that I, 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 I wanted to remark when I start to speak about experiments. Because mm -hmm. the theory that underlies uh, origami are developed under the assumption of two very difficult requirements that are quite strong. And then in the experiments, it's impossible to reconcile. And this assumption is zero thickness in the panels with infinite rigidity. And this, uh, it's quite impossible to be created in the lab. I mean, with the knowledge that we have in the manufacturing now, so maybe in 30 years it can be possible, but uh, now, well, at least, as far as I know, though maybe there are some other guys that uh, maybe can, can have other ideas, but this is what I'm thinking. Okay. And this is the best that uh, we were able to do. Of course, if someone else can improve and can suggest something, I'm more than happy to 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 do that and try to implement. But this is the triamorph pattern. You see, this is the tessellation. And, uh, in the, and uh, yeah, we have this, 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 this problem of the thickness accommodation. So I don't know if I answered to your question, but. Oh, great, great. I, I, it's great, yeah. Th thank you very much. Yeah. Diego, can I add a quick co comment on the answer? I, I think. Yes. Um, so so uh, Diego explained during the theory that the, Poisson ratio is changing sign when the mountain and valley switch, which means you might go from a crease that looks like this to one like that looks like this. Mm -hmm. And this is what's happening when it goes through zero. Mm -hmm. But when it tries to go to plus or minus infinity, the way it tries to switch mountain valley is folding through itself. Is folding yeah. through itself. And so this is why he's saying the thickness of the creases is the problem that prevents you from getting past something order one, is you need to go through like this, which is impossible, the closer you can get them together, the closer you get to diverging. And that is going to be set by this um, fabrication constraint he's saying. So completely unfold, uh, completely folded uh, 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 state. Uh, at that state, you create, you create, uh, you don't have much strain in that direction. That's compression direction. Yes. Yeah, I imagine in compression, in this direction, you don't create any strain in the in the in the compression direction, right? Yes. Uh, and then you can go uh, yes. and, uh, and then uh, uh, that strain is zero. And then in the in the in the transfer direction, you have uh, let's say positive negative strain. That's giving infinity. How about you stretch? Yes. Yes. You stretch. You are right. Uh, yes, but uh, the thing is that. Yeah. You also, no, sorry, sorry. A, you, you can... you also need to create you also need to create create a situation such that you don't have any strain yes. in the yes in the in the in the, in the, the stretch the... direction, but has yes. in, the st in the in the in the stress direction the problem is is this. Ah, you can ah. see here clearly evident the dog bone shape of the tessellation if you don't clump <laughs> in a proper way, you see. <laughs> but uh, the thing is that when you stretch, you have that the loads also tends to go to infinity because you have an alignment of these creases in this direction. So it means that the samples tend to get stiffer and stiffer. 
So after a while, you are not able to apply a load such that you can uh, the sample can squeeze in this direction. So okay. when you pull it, uh, you have the, this alignment. So the, the system tends to get stiffer and stiffer, and you are not able to close any more more than this, right? So you cannot go farther. And this is the problem in tension. Got it. Got it. Yeah, thanks. So, so Lynn, uh, if I could summarize this, just in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. However, in practice, there is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have uh, several questions. Then uh, let's go to Dr. Shishi Zhang and then uh, Professor Satish Nagaraja from Rice and then Professor Zeb in this order. Uh, Shishi, first Satish, and then Zeb. Okay, thank you, Professor Blair. Uh, hi, Diego. Very, very exciting presentation. And I'm very interested about uh, the experiment setup that you designed. And I want to ask, uh, can it be used on a staked mat material? Because if, you know, in a, a mat material with multiple layers, Maybe you have to consider about the impact of gravity. Uh, so can, can you design, can the experiment setup that you design used in, or you may update some setup or something? Thank you. Okay. I don't know if I got uh, completely the question. And by the way, I'm seeing that you are sit in my desk. Right, uh, yes, because there yes. is the poster behind. So I'm quite yeah. nostalgic about that position. <laughs> I was there exactly there <laughs> a couple of months ago. So I don't know if I got the question. So the question I repeat, and then if I got wrongly, please uh, adjust. So the question is: Imagine to have a tessellation like this. Yes. That is a, uh, and imagine that you want to test this. So this is yes. the question, yes. right? Yeah. Can be used this setup to do this? Yes. And the answer is yes. I have, if I can share, I can show also the schematic of this because I, I did that for another. Let me see. Let me see if I'm able to, to, to share very quickly this because it's quite interesting and it's a very nice question because this emphasizes even more the versatility of, of this setup. So uh, I can show you this. Uh, yeah, now I can share. Now I can share. Desktop 2. Okay, so the idea here is this one. I don't know if you can see my screen. Yes, I can see. So the idea here, imagine that you want to test the metamaterial that I showed before, the sample that I have here, and that maybe you can see in the small window in the corner of the, of, the, of the Zoom. So by stacking different levels of this slider, linear slider system, as the one reported here, imagine in this uh, part, in this part, and another one, you can, in some way, test uh, sample that are not anymore a 2D tessellation, but is a 3D metamaterial. So this is quite powerful because uh, this setup is not limited to, to D system, but also can be used to a sort of 3D metamaterial. I don't know if I answered to your question with this sketch or if you wanted to, to go deeper because I don't, uh, let me know if you, if you need other details. Yes, I understand, thank you. Okay. All right, uh, next is Satish. Satish, are you able to turn on your video so that we can see you? Uh, actually, I apologize. I'm, I'm actually driving, and so I won't be able to. Oh, uh, sorry. No problem. Go ahead. Uh, so, you know, I want to compliment uh, Diago for such a nice presentation. I have a question. I mean, maybe this is a comment because. Uh, when Professor Paulino came to Rice and gave a lecture, I think I was the first one to raise the point about hinges being so critical. And I'm so pleased to see so much work being done on the hinges part of the uh, origami. And uh, the question itself was, you mentioned about histories, right? What kind of histories are you talking about? 
Well, in that case where I mentioned hysteresis information, I mentioned that by using geometrical frustration, for instance, you can uh, put some memory inside the tessellation to create particular folding uh, mechanism. But if you are talking about the hysteresis that can emerge because of the, uh, for instance, plasticity behavior of the creases or something like that, also in that case, uh, we, we tested and uh, I can say that the, the tessellation behaves quite well, although I, I agree uh, there are some, uh, some hysteresis in the sense that if you fold the system and you unfold that, the two curves, for instance, the load and displacement curve. Uh, now I, I showed in the in the in the presentation uh, that separately from the tension and the compression. But if you take the graph and you put one each other, you can see, for instance, that the load curve in tension is not exactly superimposed to the load curve in compression because of the hysteresis uh, behavior of, of, of the crisis. So this is uh, what I, I I can say on this. Uh, you know, my, I think that's that's the answer that I was looking for. And also the suggestion is to actually look at plastic behavior of the hinge itself. If you can't do it, I think you then you will be able to control the behavior more carefully. You know, you know what I mean? Because yes, in your origami, yes. if you don't, yeah, that's what I would yes. like to suggest, actually. Your yeah. future and, study. Uh, this is uh, a... The, the, if I, if I may, is a very good suggestion. And the one thing that, to my knowledge, is missing uh, in the literature is a real, reliable hysteresis model for origami. Because uh, the models that exist for different materials or other tessellations, they are not applicable. They don't work. Or maybe a model like that could be inspired in a pre model or uh, related models, hysteretic models. This is something that we need. I don't know if Diego agrees, but sorry, Diego, for the interruption. Yes, I, I agree. And uh, and uh, I, I agree 100% with this suggestion. And then maybe I can I can add that we are working on this and, uh, and uh, both from the theoretical point of view and also from the experimental point of view, because we, we bought some particular equipment to have a look what is going on in the crisis and uh, in that stuff. And also with Professor Paulino, we are looking to the PRISAC model for rather configuration to, to capture this behavior. So this is a very nice suggestion. And uh, I think that it, it will lead to, to very nice uh, results in the near future. Well, I look forward to that. And you know, I'll close with one yes, comment. Thank you. You know, theoretical world that we work in is beautiful, right? The practical world where things actually are tested are very different. So. We can predict things beautifully in the theoretical world, but when you actually do the experiments, reality hits ground. So there are so many factors which come into the play that you cannot achieve everything that you theoretically predict, predict simply because nature prevents us to do it. So I think this is an important point that Professor Paulino made also. So I'll stop at that. Thank you so much. Wonderful work. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure uh, meeting you, although it's not in person, but uh, maybe we can have the occasion in the near future. Yeah, certainly. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Uh, Professor. Maybe Zeta. I can thank add you. a comment on this. Um, okay. So, Chris, uh, you can add the comment, and then uh, Professor Zeb Rocklin, and then Professor Xiaomin Ma. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, yes, thank you, Satish, for this uh, uh, wonderful question. I think it's uh, it's something that, because I did the, uh, my PhD with uh, Professor Paulino all on origami, like it's all origami stuff. And uh, one thing that I, re we, we, I realized is, um, for example, a lot of the nice uh, multi-stability properties that we uh, discovered in um, origami, uh, not only like they contribute with the, they, they are, um, they attribute to the nonlinearity uh, or or the um, the uh, the non rigidity of panels, but also uh, sometimes it, it's uh, it's kind of um, fictitious because sometimes you see a bistable behavior, but once you build the system elastically, there's none. Um. So 
plastic behavior and hysteresis effect does have a, a strong impact in uh, um, in the way uh, actual origami behaves, but it's typically ignored in theory and in numerical simulations. But uh, what else, but uh, uh, well, this is a good motivation and actually uh, I, I've started to look into it uh, uh, because I, uh, me and uh, Professor Paulino was the main guy to, who developed the Merlin software, which simulates you know, uh, elastic origami quite efficiently. But um, currently I'm trying to um, build into some um, plasticity into the system so that maybe we can have a better uh, simulation tool um, for this effect. Right. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank, thank you, Chris, for, for this. Uh, Zeb, you are next. All right. Great. Thank you. So so this was a wonderful talk, Diego. Um, I was curious in particular about your sort of uh, sketch of the energy landscape, where you said that you have these sort of harmonic angular springs, and then presumably because of the geometric nonlinearities that, that led to a more complex energy landscape in your model. And I, I think you even mentioned that that your model, you, you made certain uh, simplifying assumptions about uh, what the stiffnesses were of the different dihedral angles. And I was wondering um, to what extent can you use your experimental setup to actually measure that and see what the actual energy landscape is? Yeah, this is a good point. Uh, I have I have to be honest for for the paper that we I showed today. We didn't mm -hmm. we didn't measure uh, the actual energy landscape of the of the model uh, yeah. because we wanted to provide the quality. Uh, you see, yeah. this is the is the model. Yeah. You see, this is the model yeah. that. Uh, but right. in, in the near future, uh, I think that we can also do that because we can think, for instance, to 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 test uh, or maybe capturing the 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 fast the motion of the of the of the unit cell that is moving between a configuration to another with a high speed camera, maybe because of the. Of the kinematics of that, we can, uh, in some way, in an indirect way, to, to capture the energy stored into the into the crisis, mm -hmm. or maybe we can perform some uh, some test because in, in in the end we can also first of all characterize the crisis yeah. because you see here we have this crease yeah. that is glued on on the tessellation so. Probably, if we if we fix the cre one crease on on the machine and we push in the other direction, we can get a sort of constitutive relation between the moment uh, or the force yeah. and the angles. So we can, in some way, uh, characterize the the spring, and then once we characterize the spring, we have a sort of energy, yeah. uh, an equivalent uh, k, let's say, uh, uh, stiffness of, of the crease. Right. But then if we want to, to see what is going on in the tessellation, I think that the, the way is to measure, for instance, the load and to see what is going on when the, sim the, 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 the sample snap in the other configuration. Because you see, this is opening and this is closing. You see? Yeah. But, but can, can you get out force? Uh, you, sorry, can you get out force measurements from your frame so that using yeah. force times distance, yes. you can get yes. the total yes. energy associated? Yes. Yes, we can do that. We can do because in principle we can do many things. Or we can use just one cell to measure a sort of average of the load here. Or we can think, since my, the machines in our lab, they are customized. So it means that in principle we can add also a load cell here, a load cell here, a load cell here, a load cell here, a load cell everywhere, and we can get the load, for instance, that is applied here, apply here, apply here. So to have a sort of perfect average of what is going on. But in the lab, yes, we can do, we can do. But this was just a qualitative uh, example, right. you see, and uh, this is what we yeah. wanted to do. Yeah, yes, very cool. Thank you. Thank you very much for for the question, and uh, this is some hint for for further for further uh, uh, experiments and uh, and things. Thank you, Zeb. Uh, Professor Xiaomi Ma, you are next. Okay, yeah, uh, Diego, th this is a beautiful talk, a really, really cool work. So, so I have a question about the energy landscape and the frustration. So, uh, so, so, so if you don't have those angular springs, the whole kinetic path is uh, all, all zero energy, right? And uh, you, you yeah. get three minima by adding two springs, 
and the two springs favor different angles, right? So, so that that's how you get the three minima. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I'm curious. I think how so. Fine tuned. You 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 have to make it so that the three minima are of the same energy. It's not a zero, right? It's not a too arbitrary favored angle so that you get a three same energy minima, right? Yeah, I I think that this is also due, due to to a sort of uh, kinematic compatibility between the panels, because mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, if you want to uh, have a zero energy, yeah, in principle, in principle you could probably because you can change the angle here of this crisis and. Uh, and probably yes, you can also. But I don't have a perfect answer on this because I have okay. to. If I don't, I don't have a perfect answer to something. I prefer not to say because if I say something has to be perfect, I, I have to think a bit on this. I understand. Maybe yeah. I, don't know. I, I don't know if Chris or someone want to add something on this. Uh, but uh, yeah, in principle, probably is possible by changing the the rest angle of this rubber to have a zero energy. Uh, landscape, but yeah, in that I... case, you, ha you, you, you have that uh, is not so stable, probably the egg box or something like that. I see. Yeah, yeah. I, I think what I'm interested in is not making it a zero energy, but how to tune the relative energy of the three, right? <laughs> And huh, also, yeah, uh, yeah, I think when I see the video you show, it's really interesting that you can you can squeeze the edge of the system and and then somehow it 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 pops through the whole system so that you can activate it locally, right? So 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 some I I I think maybe some like a careful design is put in there so that the energy propagates and you can you can squeeze at one point and 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 pop the whole system somehow, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, the point uh, here is that we have that the two configuration are symmetric between one direction and the other. So it means that in that case, uh, we have that the, the, the energy contour is a circle. And I think that there is in the, in the supplementary material this derivation. And uh, by the derivation, we, we derived that that base energy was uh, at the same state level. But I think that is the under the assumption that we have that these two crises are the same and these two crises are the same. If we change, for instance, the stiffness of this and the stiffness of this, I think that the two states are a different level of base energy. I see. Uh, for instance, if this is stiffness one and this is stiffness 1.3, for instance, I think that the mm -hmm. base energy is different. Right, right. I see. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Xiaoming. Uh, Professor Stefano Gonella, you are next. Hey Diego. Can you hear me? Diego? Hi Stefan. Yeah, how, how are you? How are Where you? are you? Yeah, you probably Where recognize you this now? background too, right? Yeah, probably. Yeah, I have the, to pin you. One the apartment. <laughs> the ah, same apartment. apartment. That... Yes, yes. But is the 106? Is the 105? No, 105. But close enough. 105. All right. Oh, okay. So beautiful okay. stuff. I had a bit of a spoiler of the movies and everything when Glaucio presented this material at the Erringen Metal in uh, in Minneapolis a month ago. But it's beautiful stuff to look at again. I have a question following Shishi's question about, I guess, the technological aspect of uh, this uh, um, setup that you put together for the experiment. Um, two things: when when you uh, design the sliders. Were you able to work with purely commercially available slider or you had to do some tweaking? Because the values of forces are very low, right? So in order for them not to get stuck under those low values, did you have to do any special lubrication or 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 not? And second part of the question is, uh, she, she's asked about the possibility of applying this to stacked uh, tessellations for like 3D metamaterials. In that case, I assume that there is some uh, vertical sliding that needs to be allowed as well. Do you have a way to do that or you just rely on some pitching of the sliders themselves to accommodate for the vertical displacements of the layers, if any? Ah, yeah, yeah, I understand the point. So first question. Yes, I used uh, commercial sliders and uh, I bought that from uh, a supplier that is a Japanese supplier. And uh, for the purpose of this experiment, that sliders uh, worked uh, pretty well. 
but for instance, I used the same sliders for another experiments that we developed in Princeton, and I had to use some strategies because in that case, uh, because of the configuration, the sliders tend to, to be stuck. But in this case, they work. Of course, in, in, uh, in, you can buy more sophisticated sliders. So in, in the market, there are very sophisticated sliders uh, that are very zero friction. And uh, if, you, if you need to be more precise, you can buy that. But for the purpose of the experiment, we use standard uh, sliders. And because of the configuration of the tessellation that it was in 3D and uh, symmetry with, with respect to one axis. So everything was quite uh, simple and the standard slider worked well. This is what uh, we saw. Related to the other question, yeah, this is quite interesting. In, in, in the 2D tessellation, this is quite easy because uh, the tessellation can in some way move uh, freely in the, in the vertical direction and you don't feel so much this problem, but you agree, you are, you are uh, I agree with you uh, that if you put different layers in the Z direction, you need to compensate this. And one idea should be that to mount also in the vertical direction. So you have a slider in this direction uh, that is moving in this, in this way. So imagine now on the two piece PMMA to mount another slider in the vertical direction. So it means that now you have this motion, but you have also this motion that uh, in some way can uh, adjust the out of plane displacement of the system. Of course, in that case, you have to be careful because if you want that the tessellation uh, can move in the vertical direction, also the weight of the system should be kept into account because if you add so much load, then you are not uh, achieving nothing uh, good. But if you tune a bit, uh, inserting a slider also in the vertical direction, so it means that this slider is equipped with a crossed uh, system with two sliders, one in this direction and one in this. Yes, in that case, you can adjust the vertical direction as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, James, so you are next. Uh, Dio, great showmanship with the audio on the snapping. Um, enjoy, enjoy that part. So my question is whether you uh, ha have any thoughts as to the ability of snapping multiple rows together, um, ideally doing the whole thing, so transitioning the whole crease pattern from one state to another, um, potentially by introducing some thermally responsive or um, something that reacts to magnetic fields. Uh, yeah, I, I think that by applying a, a mechanical load, for instance, at the two hands uh, of the sample here, it is quite impossible to, 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 to have that all the lines snaps in the same way because it means that everything should be perfect, but there are some imperfection in the experiment. So it means that there is always a line that's not first the other. But if you, if you are able to add something that from the magnetical point of view can act independently this line and then this line, and then you can program that together. So in that case, probably using a magnetic field, for instance, you can snap the system in the same time as the one as in this case. So imagine that you are doing this. So what happened is that now you are snapping together, right? So, but I'm doing that by hand. You have something that is acting here on this, and then something that is acting here, and in the same time is creating these two, the snapping of the two configurations. But it requires probably a magnetic field or or other system because if you have some uh, shape uh, memory polymer system that is maybe responsive to light or to heat, I don't think that you can achieve that because you have always that one line uh, which is not first because you have some imperfection. It's a manufacturing process, right, in the end. But if you apply something from the external point of view, like uh, an external magnetic field, in that case, that field is so strong and can be tuned uh, by the computer. So in that case, yes, you can have contemporary at the same time that all the, the lines snaps in the same time. I think that is probably the only way that I know nowadays. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if I may, uh, I think your point is very interesting, uh, James, because uh, well, also as Diego pointed out, uh, for example, with a proper uh, magnetic actuation, and uh, here I think the magnetic is the best way to do this, then uh, you could achieve uh, distributed actuation. 
locally distributed actuation. This would be very difficult to do with a contact loads, with mechanical loading. I don't know if Diego agrees, but uh, that's my yeah. understanding. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. Yeah, uh, probably is the only way to to have a, a complete control of the tessellation. But I mean control because you can control with heat, but you know with heat is quite problematic because there are some parts that is eating faster, some parts that are eating uh, slower. And with yeah. the magnetic field, I think that is quite a powerful tool to to do this. Uh, related to James' question, yeah, as you said, with heat, uh, it's very difficult to have a uniform uh, region of temperature that yeah. uh, would allow you to properly control the system. And uh, with uh, memory, shape memory, uh, responsive uh, polymers or materials, uh, one problem is uh, the response time. They tend to take a long, 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 long time. And uh, then uh, when that time is developing other physics or the phenomena may happen and then you may have uh, experimental difficulty to understand what is going on because it takes a very long time just a couple of comments uh, any other question for uh, our speaker oh we have one from uh, professor pratapa uh, please go ahead uh, hi. Uh, uh, I, I, if I, if I may say, I, I always be concerned about uh, Pradeep's questions because it's quite uh, complicated <laughs> well, I, to 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 be answered. But anyway, go ahead, Pradeep. It's a pleasure. Well, to we meet, had to see we you. had several conversations, so I I wanted to reserve my question to the end so that everybody gets a chance. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just curious. <laughs> I think you you are the person who worked uh, you know carefully with origami metamaterials in terms of experiments. So I was very curious. Given advances in additive manufacturing and 3D printing, what's your take or on the potential for using 3D printing for origami uh, tessellations? How would they work? Or uh, because you have chosen CNC, right? Uh, and I can see why it's it's quite uh, useful in your case. But I, I was just curious why why not 3D printing? What are the issues with that? How can we overcome those? Well, I I I can start saying something that. I'm not against. I, I'm I'm not against 3D printing uh, technique. Uh, I have several printing uh, 3D printers here, so I think that is a useful uh, equipment to have in the lab. Nonetheless, being said that, I I think that for especially for uh, provide uh, uh, some uh, experiments or to perform some experiments in system that want to to show the multi-stability behavior or something like that. With the 3D printer, it's quite complicated because you have several problems. The first problem is that not only, not uh, all the 3D printers that are, can allow to, to print multi-material. So you have that, you, ha you need the specific printer that print the specific material. And this is quite expensive. If you want to print a sample of uh, two synthetic two centimeters cube, it is cost uh, $20. But imagine that you are buying the machine and uh, it is wonderful, right? But the problem is that when you print, and usually these machines that allow to the multi-material printing are based on the photopolymerization uh, technique. So it means that you have to cure the resin. So it means that you are printing something that after a couple of hours is not behaving anymore as you want. And this is quite tricky because especially for the multi-stability stuff, you, you see the multi-stability now, but then if another guy is coming to your office today, to, to, today after, you are not able anymore to see that. And uh, this is a, one problem. So the problem of the aging that is dramatic. Then if you want to print with the machine rubber-like materials, that materials are not a real rubber like the one that I used, but there are the a tremendous viscosity inside that material. So you have that it's a sort of rubber that behaves very slowly. So it's very difficult to have a snap like the one that I showed uh, before. And uh, and uh, and I think that this is the two main problems. I think that there are others, but uh, I, I I don't remember. I, I don't have them now in my in my mind for 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 replying to this question. 
But of course, there are some, uh, some cases where you cannot use the milling machine. And in that case, uh, the three printer is the only possibility, right? If you want to miniaturize something like a Kreslin or it's very complicated to be done uh, with, uh, with a CNC. So in that case, the only way is to use a 3D printer. And this is what I'm working on now, although the results are not so, so good because the system is by stable, but it's not so by stable. So it's quite complicated. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Great, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's um, an interesting idea if you did polyjet. So two materials and you had a soft material with a hinge. And I, I'm just thinking, um, you know, Dio, you pointed out when you do the CNC, the top and bottom may have some asymmetry in the stiffness, but it's 3D printing, although it gets the slow response that you mentioned, you might be able to get a more symmetric upwards folding and downwards folding behavior. Yeah. I see. Good. Great. And uh, also on the chat, we are having a very active chat with uh, a lot of discussion that uh, is very, very nice. Uh, anyone else? All right. Uh, if not, uh, Diego, uh, you gave a very nice talk. I think the Q&A was so insightful. Uh, Professor Jimmy Sha, uh, yeah. please go ahead. OK, so uh, I have a question. I have a comment. I have uh, maybe an announcement if there's no more questions uh, at the end. The question I have is, first of all, Diego, beautiful talk. Uh, really enjoyed. Uh, you, at the beginning, you showed that some of these unit cells, when you apply a tension, you have shear associated with that. But in your uh, presentation, you never gave an example of that coupling. Uh, so this asymmetric uh, property or phenomena, you didn't really show any example of this. Can you uh, maybe provide some insight on this? So, uh, I have to confess that I had some problem with the audio. Can you repeat, please, the question? Sorry. Oh, oh, okay. So at the beginning, you showed that uh, some of the unit cells, when you apply a tension, you have associated shear. So yes. there's an intrinsic asymmetry built into the system. But in your experiment, you never showed any example of that. Am I right about this? Uh, no, I don't think so. But I, may, I don't know if I got the, 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 the answer, the, the questions, but I can show again uh, the plot. So, uh, yes, due to the triclinic nature of the, of the trimorph uh, cell, we have that if we apply a, an uniaxial strain, the, 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 the vectors of the, of the lattice vectors of the, of the frame tend to change during the, the folding. So this is the phenomenon of the shear normal coupling coefficient. And in the experiments, we capture this uh, by monitoring the, the movement of the, maybe I can show again, by menu, um, uh, you see here, uh, here, in this plot, uh, here is the shear normal coupling coefficient that is a quantification of this shear effect. And as you can see that if the tessellation is Close is in the egg box mode. Since in this case we have a sort of orthotropic symmetry, the uh, shear normal coupling coefficient is close to zero. But while you enter in this mode, is activating more the triclinic nature of the system, and you have a deviation from zero. And uh, you see that here is captured by this by this plot. So yeah, the answer is yes. We monitor okay. that in the experiments by tracking the position of the vertex during the the, the test. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so the comment I have is, uh, if I listen to you and listen to all the questions, uh, if I understood them correctly, the conclusion I have is theories are beautiful, experiments are messy. <laughs> Many of the questions are from, from that, uh, essentially from the messy experimental conditions. Am I right about this? 
Yeah, yeah, so, yeah you are right. You are right. <laughs> uh, Professor Paulino has a, a w- wonderful quote uh, on this, and uh, that quote is quite uh, amazing. I, I have already that that is running in my head. And uh, yes, I can agree that uh, experiments are quite messy and uh, you can expect something from the theory, but in reality, the experiments are quite different from the theory. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. okay. Jimmy, so, can I make a comment on this? Yeah, please. Yeah, but uh, this is very important, uh, what you said in terms of the research. Because uh, the comment that I have is the following. Uh, the beauty of the theory is a very meaningful criteria, scientific uh, criteria for the research to understand what to do in the experiments. The elegance of the mathematics, the beauty of all the symmetries, uh, all the uh, geometrical features of the origami, that intrinsic beauty, I think is a valid scientific uh, criteria to guide the research. Very true, well said. Uh, actually, uh, I'm, I'm reading this book, Oppenheimer, and uh, uh, this is a Pulitzer Prize winner. And they talk about the, uh, of course, the, uh, the building of atomic bomb. Many of these things theoretically can be beautifully done. Practically, <laughs> it takes a lot of effort to make it happen. Yeah, so it's, it's an interesting, uh, for any research, we have to bear that in mind that uh, you know uh, sometimes you know that the, the, the nature or in practice things are not precise or uh, there, there are limitations to certain assumptions and so on. Okay. Jimmy, if I may, uh, if I may, Please. I completely, I, I completely agree, but uh, also. Uh, what uh, this is telling us, and uh, Diego can j- jump in uh, to tell us his, his opinion, is that uh, the theory is so beautiful. And uh, for example, uh, the mathematics of uh, origami and uh, the computational geometry, this is very old. This has been developed by mathematicians, uh, computer scientists for decades. Only recently that uh, we have been able to uh, apply some of those ideas. But uh, the comment uh, that I would like to make, Jamie, in relation to the things that you said is the following. Uh, The theory is so beautiful that uh, it is telling us something. It's telling us that, look, here is what you should do. And uh, what it is telling us is if you approach that, that is so beautiful that if you approach that, what the theory is telling you, you can achieve amazing things that you will be very surprised. And we see that all the time. And But uh, the, this is a two-edged sword. The, the counterpart of this is that uh, the field of origami is uh, extremely unforgiving. You know, it does not forgive you. And uh, this is... Uh, and then uh, you have to spend uh, a lot of time in uh, the translation from uh, the theory to the experiments to the practice, because unfortunately, the origami is extremely unforgiving. Do you agree, Diego? <laughs> yes, yes, I agree. I agree. I was able to perform these experiments. In the end, uh, they could seem simple because we are just testing uniaxially at the selection, but we worked on that for... Two, two years, more or less, to develop that setup. And uh, we start with one, uh, then uh, we had some huge discrepancy with some uh, bumps in the, uh, some bulges in the, in the plots. And then we thought wh- what we can do, what we can improve. And uh, it was everything but easy. So it was a, a, a really complicated. Also in, in appearance could seem just a uniaxial testing. So if the things are complicated more and more, it is getting uh, it is getting very very complicated. It's very complicated. Uh, Professor Satish, you know, I want to make a comment on this because I've been working on negative stiffness systems for large structures, not for origamis. Ideas and theory are so beautiful; they're essential. In fact, they're uh, absolutely essential to predict where we want to go. 
and uh, it may take us a while to prove what we think is either right or wrong. And it's often very hard. But I think theory is extremely important. And uh, in, in the case of the, you know origami structures, it tells you so many things that cannot be reproduced in experiments. But that doesn't mean it's not important. It's extremely important. So I'll, I'll stop at that. Thank you so much. Okay. Really agree. great job. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. I agree. Because maybe uh, what is going to tell the theory now that cannot be proved as experimental right now, maybe in the future with the advancement of the technology or something like that can be achieved. So I agree. Uh, also theory is telling something very important. And uh, maybe in the future also that things that now cannot be investigated from the experimental point of view, then can be proved and then can be tested in a, in a real experiment. So, yeah, yeah, I agree. It's a good Thank comment. A very, a, a very quick uh, comment. Uh, in, in general, uh, we talk a lot about uh, stiffness, for example, but we are always, many times, uh, always thinking uh, on a positive stiffness. And uh, Satish, based on what you said, and maybe you could be a great contributor on this because you understand this so well. I think there is a, a lot of work to be done with zero or near zero stiffness systems. And you can achieve that with origami and also with a negative stiffness. And uh, for example, Professor Han Ching Jung, uh, he's at uh, West Lake University. He has done uh, some uh, initial work, for example, is curved uh, folds in order to achieve uh, near zero stiffness and a negative stiffness. But uh, I think this is just the beginning. Uh, there is a lot to be done. And you, Satish, might be one of uh, the people who could contribute in that field. Oh, absolutely. I'm interested, absolutely. Because, you know, I, I've been working on this for almost three decades now, and finally we can implement this in large structures. I foresee in two decades, maybe a decade itself, this will happen in deployable structures too. So keep it up. And I will be glad, glad to, come, to contribute whatever I can. Thank you, with, Satish. With Professor Polino, of course. <laughs> you, I, I don't work yeah. in Oregon myself, but you know, in okay. collaboration with Professor Polino. Thank okay. you, Satish. Uh, maybe... and, uh, Jimmy, yeah. Uh, let let me wrap it up by uh, thanking Diego for giving a wonderful talk and uh, Glossio for, for uh, being the discussion leader. Wonderful, wonderful discussion. And uh, I have an announcement. Uh, the next EML webinar would be given by Sophie Wang of uh, University of Connecticut. Uh, and we haven't uh, fixed the date yet, uh, but we'll, we'll keep you in, uh, informed once we, we have a date for that webinar. Meanwhile, let me thank all of you for participating in this uh, EML webinar. And the webinar would be uh, archived and it's a permanent record. Anybody who has access to uh, YouTube can go to the website and watch all the EML webinars, including this one uh, Diego gave. Thank you all very much. You have a good, uh, depending on where you are, you have a good rest of the day for Glossio, or you have a good night for me. I'm in Singapore, actually. This 12, 16 a.m. <laughs> oh, have a good evening, Jimmy. Great work. Thank OK, you. thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye, bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye, you. bye, bye, bye. 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 bye.